everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. We are 100% sponsor based, which means that all the revenues we derive come from sponsorships. But I try to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically trying to choose those who have values well aligned to the values expressed on the show, like freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm going to do is a few ad reads right here at the top of the show and then a few ad, ad reads in the middle. And I hope you won't skip them. I hope you'll take the time, listen and see what they have to offer, because again, these are hand selected sponsors. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Pacific Bitcoin Conference, brought to you by Swan. Now this is going to be a two-day event in Los Angeles, November 10th and 11th, 2022. And if you haven't been to a Bitcoin conference yet, I highly recommend it, as there really is no better way to get integrated into the Bitcoin community. Speakers announced so far include Michael Saylor, Lynn Alden, uh, many others. I'll be speaking as well. Uh, Michael Saylor is even quoted as saying, this is going to be the event of the year, so you definitely don't want to miss it. Uh, so go to PacificBitcoin.com and use discount code BREEDLOVE to get your tickets today. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Ledin. Ledin lets you do more with your digital assets. For instance, Ledin offers a B2X loan product that lets you leverage your existing Bitcoin to buy even more Bitcoin. Or you can also get traditional Bitcoin collateralized U.S. dollar loans through Ledin as well. Ledin also offers both Bitcoin and USDC denominated savings accounts, letting you generate yield on your digital assets. Recently, Ledin has launched a Bitcoin mortgage product as well that lets you use Bitcoin to buy a home or finance one that you already own. So go to Ledin.io, that's L-E-D-N.io today to sign up. Joseph Wang, welcome to the What Is Money Show. Hey, thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you on. Uh, you are better known on Twitter as FedGuy12. That's F-E-D-G-U-Y-1-2. Um, and it says here you are a former senior Fed trader, currently sharing your personal views and not investment advice. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's so, right. I used to work. Go ahead, sorry. Uh, I used to work on the open markets desk of the New York Fed. So, um, what your audience may not know is that the Fed actually has a trading desk, and that trading desk is the means through which the Fed conducts monetary policy. For example, when they do quantitative easing, when they're lending money to foreign banks through the FX swap lines, or when they're taking in money from the reverse repo facility, that's done by the open markets desk. And I was there on the money markets team. So I mm. studied a lot about the financial system, about money markets, about the monetary system. So it seems like um, it's just right for the title of the show. Yeah, spot on. We talk a lot about central banking, its history, and its many, many problems. Um, so that's interesting. Okay, maybe you could just expand on that a little bit for us. You said that the Federal Reserve has a trading desk that they're conducting these open market operations. And this is the primary mechanism they use to put liquidity into or take liquidity out of the markets, if yes. I'm not mistaken. And then could you just explain in more layman's terms for people, like what does that actually mean? I, I think a lot of the times I've struggled with this myself is that we, we that understand the jargon tend to fall back on it with the presumption that other people understand it. But often, even terms as straightforward as monetary policy, many people, I think most people don't know what that is. So could you perhaps decompose these open market operations and what the Federal Reserve or other central banks are actually doing through this mechanism? Sure. So the trading desk of the Fed implements monetary policy. So what happens is that the FOMC, the Federal Open Markets Committee, they're basically like gods on Olympus and they decide, they look into the stars and they decide where is our star, where is so forth, should we be raising rates or lowering rates? And when they decide that, well, someone actually has to go and do that. Someone actually has to go and raise rates. Someone actually has to go and lower rates or someone actually has to go and conduct quantitative easing. And all that 
basically mostly falls to the open markets desk. Um, you can think of it as, for example, if the Fed thinks that monetary policy is, let's say, needs to be easier, like they did in 2008, 2009, then they go and they say, hey, we should do something to kind of lower um, longer term interest rates. We should go and we should buy treasuries. We should do quantitative easing. What happens then is that the open markets desk goes out and he goes and actually goes and buys those treasuries. Mechanically, it's really simple. Um, they hold an auction, a reverse auction, and then uh, primary dealers come and they offer to sell the Fed securities and the Fed tries to accept the offers that are best. Where does the Fed get that money? It just creates that out of thin air and poof, it's executed. Um, during times, now that's just one operation. The Fed does many things. If you think back to what happened in March 2020 when you had tremendous stress in the financial system, then the Fed was performing all sorts of operations and most of those were conducted on the open markets desk as well. Um, for example, uh, we had some sh significant stress in the repo market um, back in 2019 and in 2020. And what happens then? The Fed is there lending, the open market stack is there lending um, in the repo market, uh, creating cash out of thin air, lending it to the primary dealers. Um, the same thing happens when the Fed uh, wants to support the offshore dollar funding markets. Say somewhere, someone, some, say a foreign bank somewhere, um, it, let's say in Europe, for example, needs some dollars. What happens then is that that foreign bank can, though, can then borrow from their foreign central bank, who then in turn borrows from the Fed through what's called an FX swap line. That also originates from the trading desk. So in that case, the trading desk would also uh, handle that transaction and basically create money out of thin air and lend it. So um, I think of the open market desk as basically the ultimate source of dollars in the entire world, simply because most of the operations that originate, uh, that the Fed does originate from the trading desk. And it's a place where you can get a very good view of how the financial system functions. Um, when I was on the desk, for example, we were oftentimes the first to know if something bad was happening. The open market desk has relationships with people all throughout the financial world. We speak with all the banks, we speak with the hedge funds, we speak with the investment funds, foreign central banks. We try to figure out what's happening in the markets. And when something happens, they usually let us know and we relay it onto the Fed and maybe something, maybe they do something about it. So it's a, it's a really good way to get a behind the scenes view of what's happening in the financial system and how everything fits together. I heard you say print money out of thin air at least three times in that description. <laughs> so is there uh, the basis of these operations is the creation of money from nothing? Well, that's the whole point of a central bank. It's ultimately, mm -hmm. if you think about it, Historically, what's the point of a central bank? It's to act as a lender of last resort to the commercial banking system. So let's go back 100 years. Um, sometimes we would have panics in the banking system. So uh, one bank, for example, maybe a lot of people go and withdraw money from that one bank and the bank doesn't have enough cash on hand to meet those withdrawals. What happens then? Maybe uh, it has to suspend those withdrawals. Maybe it has to fire some assets. The depositors, they panic. They think there's something wrong with the bank. Then they, everyone starts to withdraw money from the banking system. And then you, you get these classic bank runs where people line up outside of bank and try to get their money out. That's just not good. Mm -hmm. uh, you know That creates a lot of economic distress. And so in order to solve that problem, uh, the authorities came up with the idea of a central bank. And not just in the US, this is how the world evolved across. Uh, this is how basically all the advanced uh, economies evolved having a central bank in order to lend to that commercial bank to avoid these liquidity runs. Mm -hmm. um, over time, though, this function has evolved. The central banks today are not just lenders of last resort to commercial banks, but they are also lenders of last resort to a growing portion of the financial economy. For example, the Fed acts as lender of last resort for dollars to foreign commercial banks. Um, or, for example, if you recall during COVID, it was also lender of last resort to the to corporations by lending mm -hmm. in the corporate bond market. So this is kind of how the uh, institution has evolved over time. Mm. Yeah, the, the I guess there's rather than legally requiring banks 
run full reserves, right? Meaning that they have one for one assets to liabilities, or at least deposit liabilities they're they are holding as current assets. Um, in which case you cannot have a bank run, right? That would be depositors coming to redeem all their money from the bank. The bank would have enough assets on hand to meet those redemptions. So it wouldn't really be a bank run. It would just be a bank conducting his business as usual. Rather than requiring banks be full reserve, we implemented the central bank as a means of backstopping fractional reserve banks. Is that correct? Well, well, the thing is that money is created by commercial banks. So all banks have to be fractional reserve banks by definition. For example, if you had pro reserve banking, where does the money come from then? You know, money has to be created by banks out of thin air, backed against loans rather than something like currency. Well, so, so here's fraction. here's a crux of the, the namesake of the show here. What is money? <laughs> so what is gold in that <laughs> instance? Um, well, so what is money is a profound question, and it's going to vary across time, obviously. Now, in the West, people for a period of time thought of gold as money. But if you look longer, longer in history or across the, across the pond to, let's say, China, people used uh, paper money for thousands of years, and as they did in other old countries as well. And if you go even further, money was things like things, things like uh, sacks of rice or maybe even farm animals. So it's definitely a cultural definition that varies over time and across culture. So it's a very, you know, it's a it's a very hard thing to pin down. Mm. Today, I think what people think of as money is, you know, it varies as well. Directly. For example, many people think about the pieces of paper they have in their wallet. In the U.S., these are Federal Reserve notes. They think of that as money. They also think of, um, let's say, if they log into a bank, what do they see in their banks? They see, you know, deposit accounts. Those are bank deposits, liabilities created by a bank, and they think of that as money as well. Um, and some people think of Bitcoin as money. It really depends on who you ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, okay, that's a question I'd like to expand upon there is you said that at least in one definition of money that the commercial banks are lending it into existence effectively. So without that lending process, there could not really be money. But as you said, also you also said in many different historic or cultural contexts, we've used animals as money, glass beads, sand, seashells, ultimately gold. So how do you, it seems like money can exist independent of these lending operations of commercial banks. That's like, what what is gold? What are these animals, glass beads, et cetera? So do you think it is necessary that we have commercial banks lending money into existence for a functional economy? Or is this just a system that we have adopted uh, for some reasons? Um, well, I think of the social institutions we have today as products of, you know, thousands of years of evolution. You have many countries throughout the world, many societies throughout the world, they try different things, right? They they have different technologies. They try and those that uh, have successful technologies, those that, that have successful evolutions, those, those institutions, they survive. And what I see across the world is that it seems like the creation of banking and credit is something that is that is fairly common. And so that suggests to me that this is an institution that provides a function that is helpful for society. And I think it's easy to see why. Um, for example, let's say um, I have a really good idea and I just need some capital to put it into practice. Mm -hmm. Well, if I can go to a bank and I can get that capital, if they can loan me some money, then maybe I can put my idea into pro into into reality, maybe that's beneficial for society and for me. Maybe that's how we can progress more quickly than someone, than a than a society where that kind of institution wasn't available. So I, I don't think it's necessary. Obviously, if you go to, I think less developed societies, let's say tribes in Africa, you wouldn't have bank, uh, but then you wouldn't have as much progress as we do here in the West. So mm. it seems like this institution has, uh, you know, been useful in so far as you judge things like wealth and technological progress as markers of success in a society. Mm. Yeah, it's difficult to disentangle that at times because it's very easy to attribute, say, the past 120 years of technological 
success or innovation, you could say, oh, well, that's because we had credit in the central bank. But I think this is why uh, econ economics and economic history are divorced because you can't, you could equally cast aspersions at the central bank saying it's been ham hamstringing innovation for the past 120 years. And you get in a very, uh, very difficult spot to argue one side or the other effectively, in my opinion. So I agree completely. Yeah. Let me share this perspective with you. I'd just love to hear your thoughts because I see gold became money because it best satisfied the properties of good money, which, which I talk a lot about on this show. But the one thing that gold really lacks, there's a few areas, but one that it sorely lacks is portability. We can't move gold across space very effectively. It's very expensive. It's risky to do so, et cetera. So... I see this explosion of debt-based money in the world as a augmentation of gold, basically. Let's put all the gold in one place and then put an application on top of it called currency. And then that makes gold much faster, much more portable, let's say. And so long as that currency is redeemable for gold, you get all of the monetary properties of gold gathered into this little paper banknote. The problem, of course, is you now have to trust the bank or the custodian. And that's been a pretty bad bet in, in many places and many times across history. So I guess my question is this, I, I, if gold could be moved at the speed of light, do you think banks or central banks would have ever come into existence? Absolutely. Um, because the thing is, let's say, okay, how do we, okay, so let's say that in that case, then how does who determines who gets money? Now, in that case, if you're if you're really under a gold standard, even if it's very portable, then money isn't necessarily allocated to the people who will put it to the best use. Now, if you have a bank allocating credit, creating money to people who they think are creditworthy, then on average, I'd expect that money goes to people who actually put it to good use or at least pay it back. But when you're on a gold standard, your money basically allocates to whoever strikes strikes it rich in a gold mine. Um, you know, that that doesn't really there's not that the people who are good at digging a hole and putting up a bunch of gold out of the ground are not necessarily people who would, let's say, deploy that in ways that 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 are beneficial to society. Um, one of the things that we've seen in the past, for example, Spanish go to the New World find a whole bunch of silver, bring it back. Do they use that to invest in Spain and make it into a great country? No, they're miners. They go and they spent it all and created huge belts of inflation throughout Western Europe. So it's not just about... So if you want to talk about just what money is, I think you also have to think about the social properties as to who gets to allocate, uh, who gets money. And uh, so far, it seems, if you look at what we have with our current system, it seems to be not perfect, but compared to someone who was purely commodity based, who doesn't have a bank, who can't create credit, it seems to be much better. How do I know this? Because all the societies that were managed that way, well, they don't really exist or they, they, they live in huts. When you say societies that were managed in what way? Sorry. Sorry. Uh, commodity money, no banks. Is it? I would ask you again: Is it possible to have an advanced economy? Is it possible to have an advanced or technologically advanced economy if you don't have banks? I well, don't think I don't, it is. Yeah, you know, it, this is. Sorry, go ahead. So again, it's I. I like to think of the world from an evolutionary lens. When we look across, I mean, let's say that we have different cultures and institutions in competition. Somewhere else, there weren't there were societies that did not have banks, or maybe thought they were bad. Where are those societies now? I mean, they, I, I, I can't think of any advanced or wealthy or technologically advanced country that doesn't have this institution. So that tells me that it's important. Um, so if you have a bank, you really can't have, so banks create money, create credit, that's the whole thing. You, a pure gold standard is compatible uh, with banking because we had banks and gold centers, whereas the banks would create money that's redeemable in gold. Um, but you really have to have banks be able to create money and to allocate it in an efficient way. 
um, if you didn't have them, then you would also have everlasting deflation, right? Let's say you had only X amount of gold in the world, then all the people who got in first, let's say the boomers of the world, would just have that money and it would become ever more important, ever more valuable. Mm. Yeah, that's So it's a fairness argument as well. uh, yeah, fair enough. The, I guess my perspective here is that I agree that institutional realities emerge through an evolutionary process, but I think that evolutionary process is also grounded out in physics, ultimately, physical reality. And it seems to me like the fact that gold is a physical commodity metal that became the preeminent asset in the world. That's the reason we needed custodians, right? It's the physicality of gold that caused us to need the custodian, which is an, originally the warehouse that becomes the bank that becomes a central bank. And so this is why I'm so fascinated with Bitcoin and that if we have basically perfected or close to perfected the economic properties of gold, but put it into a non-physical vehicle, we have dematerialized gold, then that really, that's a brand new technological basis uh, that I think is, is disruptive to, or at least transformative to the institutional realities that emerge on top of that technological reality. So I guess I see technological reality as layer one, and then institutional realities are sort of built up around whatever technologies are dominant in the era. I think Bitcoin, that kind of, it's a very attractive asset. I would love to have a portable asset that's, you know, like you, like you mentioned, something that can easily be transported and not easily change. Like mm. people, nobody can really steal it. I think that's, that those are very attractive properties. Mm. Um, and, you know, if I look at the price of Bitcoin, it seems like it seems to be fairly resilient. So there's a lot of people in the world who will hold that view as well. Um, I think uh, that, that I think, You know, things like this have a great future as an asset, but being able to play the role as something that, let's say, everyday transaction, that's a bit more, that's something different Mm. um, because you need to have institutional support, you need to have cultural support, and you need to be able to have the over amount, all amount grow and shrink. It needs to be elastic because sometimes, Mm. for example, we have a growing population, we're going to need more money, or we have a boom, we're going to need more money, or sometimes we have, let's say, shrinking population or uh, let's say that economic times are bad, then obviously we the money supply has to be elastic because everything else in the world is, is changing all the time. It mm. makes sense for the supply to have to adapt as well. That doesn't mean that I, I, I mean, so that's what I think of as important for, mm. uh, for something to be properly part of the um, monetary system. Are you, you're probably familiar with the work of Jeff Snyder, I imagine. Uh, I, I've, uh, I've read some of Jeff Snyder's work. Okay. I had him on the show for a series um, focused on kind of the history of money and central banking. And we got very hung up on this exact point of he does not believe in Bitcoin because he thinks it is it does not supply the financial system with adequate monetary elasticity. So flexibility of the money supply, essentially. Um. I don't actually buy that argument at all. Uh, it's a hard disagree for me. I don't think you need elastic money at all. Um, now, that said, I do also believe in free banking. So if you have free banking where they are lending off of their own balance sheet, there is no lender of last resort, then you effectively do have elasticity in the money supply because the I mean, these guys are free to do whatever they want. They can run fractional reserves. They're trading against their own balance sheet and reputation. So that all makes sense to me. And that free banking reality, that's possible on a gold standard, on a Bitcoin standard, on any standard, frankly. So that's where I feel, I guess, I don't believe, I don't buy the argument on the face of it that we need elastic money at all. But even if we did need elastic money, if I just put that one aside and said we do need elastic money, it's still possible in a free banking system. Do you, how do you, see that well no i we could definitely have a let's say a free banking system where the reserve asset is bitcoin can totally that could totally work no problem at all um except that let's say there is a banking crisis there's a panic um and let's say 
who in in your in your idea there's no lender of last resort, then you're going to subject society to a lot of volatility. Uh, we tried that for a long time, not just the U.S., but you know countries all over the world tried that, and it didn't work well. So that's why there's a central bank to try to tap and down on these panics. Now, if you have a central bank, I think it's difficult to have a central bank in a Bitcoin standard world because the central bank then, how do you act as lender of last resort if you can't create Bitcoin yourself? So, exactly. so that that's kind of that's kind of a straitjacket there. Um, I mean, I guess you could be a central bank. You could own a lot of Bitcoin and just try to use that to to, um, to stem the panic. Um, and we've, I think, a lot of institutions have done that before. For example, when we were under um, the gold standard, the UK the Bank of England held a ton of gold, and it, it was enough to 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 um support the banking system but ultimately one day it was not enough and so mm -hmm. they had to devalue and that that's that if you had a if you had a system built on bitcoin that would probably have to happen as well so mm. uh, you know it's just a function of uh yeah if, I know, if you have an elastic money supply you really need to have a lender of last resort i think and if you have a lender of last resort you really need to have that lender being able to actually lend infinitely and that's hard to do unless you are on a fiat system um because then you might run out of gold or bitcoin yeah i don't yeah i don't think it's it's not pragmatic or even possible to have a lender of last resort on a pure bitcoin or gold standard because the lender of last resort would go out of business. Yeah. I'm curious as to why you don't think that we need an elastic money supply. Well, I think that um, money is a proxy for time and energy. And, you know, it increase the in money increases in purchasing power to the extent that we increase the capital stock in the world or our productivity. And so if I'm holding a hard money and the world is economizing, as the purchasing power in my savings grows, I have an incentive to spend that. Like you always have an incentive to, cons to, you have unrealized gains basically built into your savings vehicle. So the more purchasing power grows, the greater the incentive for you to spend and circulate that money. Now, if at any point there tends to be this counter argument to hard money that, um, you know, these miserly few end up hoarding all the money and they constrict everyone else of liquidity and everyone else starves to death. But that doesn't work either because if you consider that the natural interest rate, and now it's not, I know there's many arguments about this. It's not technically the price of money, but it's commonly considered to be the price of money. Uh, it's where the supply of loanable funds meets the demand for loanable funds. In a world where the miserly few are constricting and hoarding, quote unquote hoarding, this is a value judgment, by the way, we can't draw a line between one man's savings and one man's hoarding. It's just a, where do you draw the line? It's, it's, it's purely subjective. If there's a small group of people hoarding all the hard money and the, all the purchasing power is accreting to them, there's huge demand for liquidity in the marketplace. Well, that means there's a huge demand for loanable funds. So the natural interest rate is exploding which is creating a huge incentive for the hoarders of hard money to lend that money into the marketplace. So I think I always come back to the free market as the ultimate referee or self-regulatory mechanism for all of all of the allocation of resources and capital in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I, I understand that. I understand that. Yeah. Mm. But I admittedly, I'm a I'm a diehard. Uh, you probably call me like an anarcho libertarian or anarcho capitalist. Like I'm very. The other thing about lender of last resort is that it sort of implies the need for taxation and inflation. Like you have, if the lender of last resort is going to be creating money out of thin air, there has to be a legal monopoly on that money for them to create the money out of thin air what funds and supports the legal monopoly it's the theft and coercion of taxation and inflation so i'm admittedly strongly against all of that i understand that's interesting i guess i have to think about your um, point about the market just being able to if there's i mean just higher interest rates draw demand and so forth mm.
But I, I also wonder though, because when I think about this, I think about, let's say California real estate, for example, I see all these boomers who basically got in early and just kind of rolled the wave and just became uber rich off this and mm -hmm. of no, nothing, no, just because they were born early. And then I see all these young people in California who basically forever surfs simply because they were born late. And th the problem with an inelastic money supply to me is, well, you basically are creating universal boomerism, whereas the people who get who got coins first, they become rich and maybe they can lend if they want to someone else and basically live very well forever. Let's say the other people, they can get money, they can buy a house, but at an enormous cost. And in, in your example, that would be interest rates. So you kind of basically creating a version of serfdom for everyone who came in last. And that, that seems to me a very difficult society to justify uh, from an equitable standpoint, but also not sustainable because by definition, I think the people who got uh, got in first, and if you have a growing population, they're increasingly small minority. So you're basically creating a permanent upper class of people who can just get rich off of being there first and can lend their coins to other people and live off interest rates, who, which, uh, as you suggested, will be high because um, there's just not that much money. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah. that's that's a that's a hard society to to manage. I think it's a good point that there is always this element of fortune or luck in all human action, all human affairs. Um, you know, if you're, it's basically true everywhere, right? No matter what you do, what business you buy, what you're involved in, you're betting on the future. You may or may not get, you may or may not be fortunate basically. So in the case of people with California real estate, yeah, many people did get lucky, right? They, either were born into a land or maybe they inherited real estate or maybe they were smart enough to foresee where the demand was going and they bought it in anticipation of other people waking up to that reality and they became prosperous just by, by making that bet. But I would draw the line on the serfdom because I mean, serfdom as I understand it would be forcibly enslaving people to work a property under the threat of violence or coercion or legal compulsion, you know, some threat basically. And I don't see that in California real estate. I mean, now to the extent we strip out all the state taxation stuff, that's all coercive. Um, I really see people freely exchanging you know, people buying and selling real because there's also the risk of holding the real estate. You could have been completely wrong. You could have got, bought the California real estate 50 years ago thinking it's going to be hot and maybe Southern California broke off into the ocean in an earthquake. So there's this risk and reward element that goes with entrepreneurship that I think distinguishes it from outright serfdom because a surf is going to be someone that does not participate in the rewards or the upside, right? They're just being compelled by force by someone. And I don't see that in, in a consensual exchange market like real estate. My words are too strong. I think what I'm trying to get at is there's no, there's limited upward mobility in such a world because the people who got there first have an overwhelming advantage. And the same would be in a world where you had just, I think, uh, you know, in a no fractional reserve banking, in a fully reserve, no, no fractional banking world, because the people who got Bitcoin first, they have all the money, they lend it out, and the people who can borrow to try to invest, they borrow, but it's at high interest rates. So uh, it'll be like the uh, working family in California trying to afford million dollar one bedroom apartments, but having to pay high mortgage rates and really um, having trouble to meet the down payment, whereas the people who got before them could have worked part-time in college and simply got in first to purchase a, a house. It's just a distributional question. I mean, it's... it's uh... Yeah, I, th I, I think the implications are even more radical than that, though. Because if, yeah. you, if you're running a society on a hard money standard, you actually have a very low incentive to borrow. If the purchasing power of money is going up every year rather than going down, right? If it's going down every year, I want to borrow dollars today and pay back weaker dollars over time. 
But in a Bitcoinized world where the purchasing power of money is expected to increase year over year, I would be kind of foolish to borrow weaker Bitcoin today and have to pay back more expensive Bitcoin in the future. So you have to have high rates, very high. Like you suggest, interest rates would have to be high. Yeah, I think, well, they'd just be natural, whatever. I don't know if they would end up being high or low, but it would not be a centrally planned market as it is today. What makes you think it's centrally planned today? Well, doesn't the Fed go and look at the stars, as you said, and tell you what the interest rate's supposed to be and then set you guys out to make that happen? <laughs> Isn't that central planning? Uh, I think if you have a lender of last resort, you necessarily have a central bank influencing interest rates mm -hmm. because that lender of last resort has to lend at certain interest rate, right? So whatever they're willing to lend at has to affect market rates somehow. So uh, it's just part of the system. And, you know, I think going back to, to your idea about, uh, you know, it, in an elastic money system, let's say I borrow money and then I have to go and pay it back, right? Where do I get that new money to pay back? Well, the money system keeps expanding so I can continue to to easily find money to to pay it back. But if the money supply is fixed, then I'm really going to that mo I'm going to have to try to convince someone else to give me their money. The money supply is not expanding, so that that would be deflationary because I'd have mm. to try to lower prices to to get convince people to give me their money. So that I think that yeah, I think that that that's uh, that that really does change how things are run today. Uh, today we try to have a two percent inflation target. Uh, I think you would have basically perpetually deflation if you had a hard money standard. Which yeah, is, I think, yeah, I think so. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that'd be very different from what we're used to. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin-enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it, legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian, Chris Rock. Insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to. There's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. <laughs> and I give a company some money in case shit happens. Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> <laughs> so with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through crowd health. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. Wasabi lets you use Bitcoin privately while still maintaining full control over your money. Specifically, Wasabi Wallet is an open source, non-custodial wallet with privacy built in by default. By using Wasabi, you're effectively putting the private back in private property. Wasabi Wallet is an easy to use privacy wallet that can support any amount of Bitcoin transactions. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state of the art wallet software. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Swan Private. Swan Private is a concierge financial services firm based in Los Angeles. Now, I've known the Swan team for years, and these guys are laser focused on the Bitcoin mission. They even have a zero tolerance policy for all shitcoin. Recently, their CEO, Corey Clipston, was instrumental in calling out many of these crypto scams right before they collapsed, saving a lot of people a lot of money in the process. Swan Private focuses on guiding high net worth individuals and businesses on all aspects of Bitcoin strategy, including buying, custodying, and market research. This concierge service provides you direct access to a private advisor by text, phone, or email. So go to swanprivate.com slash breedlove today to sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Masterworks. Masterworks gives you access to the fine art market at more affordable price points. They do this by offering you fractional shares in their $500 million portfolio of fine art. Now, fine art is an alternative asset class, and historically, it's been a great performer and a really good hedge against inflation. 
Most investors typically hold anywhere from 2 to 10% of their assets in an asset like fine art. To sign up or learn more, go to masterworks.com and use promo code BREEDLOVE. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, today to sign up and use discount code BREEDLOVE. And these terms, inflation and deflation, they get thrown around a bit wildly, but I would like to be very specific. Um, when you're saying perpetual deflation, you're talking about price deflation, effectively. Or we could say the value for money goes up every yes. year. Yes, yes. Purchasing power is increasing. Now, I want to ask you a question about monetary inflation, which is the actual inflation. Let's say the arbitrary inflation of a fiat currency supply within the agus of a central bank legal monopoly on money. So arbitrary increases to the money supply. Is that theft? Um. Well, so how does money supply increase? So I think that's worth thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, if, for example, the central bank, well, I'm going to be more concrete here. If the central bank is going out increasing the money supply, let's say printing money to buy assets, um, I think it's important to keep in mind that they're adding money into the system, but they're also taking an asset out. So at the end of the day, it's it's not necessarily uh, you, you add something but you take it out so net on net it's it's not really clear if you're changing the amount total assets uh, in the system you're just kind of changing the composition now the broader question as to whether inflation is theft I don't think so and I'll tell you mm -hmm. why the price of everything is always changing now if you look across the price of bread or even the price of Bitcoin or price of computers, it goes up and down throughout, throughout, um, throughout history. Uh, I think it's, I think it's misleading to think that anything stays fixed. Obviously it doesn't. So if prices go up, sometimes prices go down, sometimes prices go up. I don't think it's useful to think of it in terms of theft or even, um, lucky windfall gains. Let me be a little more specific. That's why I tried to, distinguish monetary inflation from price inflation. I'm not arguing that I, price changes. I don't, of, I don't understand the difference. Uh, well, price inflation is just when the price of something goes up. Monetary inflation okay. would be the actual units of currency are arbitrarily increased or decreased. Well, e increased in the case of inflation. So let me try to make it a little more straightforward. When the Federal Reserve buys US government bonds, you said you said they're just changing the composition of the asset mix, right? Because they're buying an asset, right? That the U.S. government can produce ad infinitum, which is debt, right? A promise to pay money in the future, and then the Federal Reserve produces another asset out of thin air called dollars, yep. and they swap that, right? And so the exactly. debt goes onto the central bank balance sheet, dollars go on into the Treasury's balance sheet, Treasury starts spending. Now, in that particular transaction. Is purchasing power being taken from all the people in the world saving in dollars in that case by the newly issued dollars that go to the government? I don't think so, no. Um, the way that I would think about this is that a treasury security is a form of money. If you think about it, if you have a $100 bill, it's printed by the Federal Reserve, by the, by the government. Is that really so different from $100 in treasury bonds? It's also printed by the government. Also, no credit risk, also very liquid. So but treasury bonds really, in my view, are just kind of another form of money. There's just basically money that pays interest. So this is a circular thing, though, because if we say there's no credit risk on the U.S. treasury bond, 
because they can print money to pay the bonds. Yep. Yep. Aren't we trapped in this circular logic of, oh, well, that's money. This is money. It's whatever the government says is money is money. But that's distinctly ahistorical, right? We have gold, which is a non-governmental money. We've had many non-governmental monies. So at what point did the government become the de facto authority on what is and is not money? Uh, I think money, well, so money is whatever. So it could be decided on an individual level. For example, if I open up a store, I can only be willing to accept maybe payment in gold. Sure, I can do that. Um, so it is in part a cultural and a social agreement. I think it's not that the U.S. government just suddenly decided that dollars are money. I think that everyone in the United States and most parts of the world decided that dollars are money. The United States government, of course, likes this, but it's, of course, like you suggested, not really their call to make. Other people have to be willing to accept it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but... It, well, and but it took we, gold yeah. to make the dollar accepted, right? Because the dollar was once redeemable for gold, which is what gave it its original network effect exactly. as money. So I think what I think in my view, the ultimate credibility, I mean, it, it so because the currency system is in part managed by the government, it's the strongest credibility in the government that the government will be able to manage it uh, faith, faithfully and well. And the gold standard was a way to uh, instill confidence uh, that the government wouldn't just mismanage it completely because you could always redeem it for gold. It's a constraint on government, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so what happened, I think, in the past few decades is that confidence in government grew so strong that the government did not actually feel that they needed this extra constraint to make themselves more credible. Um, but as I think we're seeing now, they just, you know, maybe are not as credible as they used to be. And so are kind of spending a lot more and creating a lot more money than uh, than is prudent. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense on gold. I've, I agree with the framing gold as a constraint on government because, you know, historically, if your government was being oppressive or irresponsible in monetary policy, right, you could take your gold and leave, go to another country. Um, so post 1971, then have governments just thrown off that constraint? Is that what's happened? Is that why the government has grown to the degree that it has over the past 50 years? I think it, I think that's a big part of it. Yep. If you, when you don't have a constraint, then you can continue to create money. And for some reason, many people have confidence enough in the government that they're willing to accept and hold money created by these governments. I think that seems to be changing. I think we're going into a world where maybe people have less confidence in government. Maybe one manifestation of that is just higher inflation. You can think of it as people holding money and trying to get rid of it and buying tangible goods. By definition, that increases the level of price. So um, it seems like we've forgotten some of the things that our forefathers learned, that it's good to have constraints on government because people in government are just normal people. They have their incentives and they're not necessarily trying to do what's best for the public, but they maybe they just want to help themselves. So having constraints on their ability to do that is historically good and um, kind of built into the founding principles of the United States. We have, for example, the Bill of Rights. We have uh, checks and balances, three co-equal branches of governments that uh, we're basically throwing all that stuff away. Mm. Yeah, amen to all of that. Uh, yeah, I, I guess that is one of the areas Bitcoiners are passionate about is reapplying this constraint on government <laughs> you know gold so, has worked to some extent but it seems like it's really stopped working over the past 50 years um one of the things that i've seen is that you know the governments in some places seem they have the power to just shut bitcoin down like in china for example how do you guys handle something like that happening in some other part if that were to happen up here for example in the u.s let's say the government says that Bitcoin is a tool for money laundering and everyone who, who uses it must be subject to uh, IRS tax audits. After all, they did hire like 80,000 new agents. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I like the question about China, actually, because, I, well, would you agree China is one of the most 
significant authoritarian regimes in the world? Absolutely. Definitely the most technologically advanced authoritarian regime in the world. And you know, they you go there. Yeah. If you have a low social credit score, you know, people call you, they get a warning. This guy has a social credit score that's very low. You should be careful about him. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that's pretty scary. That is extremely scary. And Bitcoin has been banned, rebanned, banned again, unbanned, rebanned, banned again in China, like multiple, multiple, multiple times. The most recent effort was to exodus all Bitcoin mining operations from China. Now, if one of the most powerful, I would argue the most powerful authoritarian regime in human history, really, I mean, they've got 1.3, 1.4 billion people under a tight iron fist. Um, I don't think there's ever been a, a regime, an authoritarian regime at large, at least in terms of people, probably not in terms of GDP either. Um, if that regime that has banned Bitcoin mining, this is over a year ago at this point, yet 20% of Bitcoin's global hash rate is still coming out of China. I think this bodes really well for Bitcoin's chances against any other government attempting to ban it. Um, again, like you said, people follow incentives, not laws, right? I'm not, not that you said that exactly. I'm sort of paraphrasing a message you just said, just to be clear. And I think there is just this extremely strong incentive to monetize otherwise stranded energy sources that states and constituents are going to be unable to resist the the asymmetry of embracing bitcoin versus trying to ban it is just so lopsided that over time i think um it's like that gandhi quote right first they laugh at you then they ridicule you then they fight you then you win um i see bitcoin as just just an idea really right it's just an idea there's a piece of code you run and if you compete if you apply energy to that network you have the chance to turn it into money into bitcoin now you don't have to keep the bitcoin you can sell it for dollars or whatever you want but it's it's a way to monetize energy and i don't see human beings being able to resist that in any shape form or fashion so when you combine that strong incentive with the apparent inability of even the most powerful authoritarian regime in human history to stop it, how do you stop it? What, what uh, this is the this is the hundred trillion dollar question. Bitcoiners, Bitcoiners keep asking themselves and others, like, how do you stop it? And I mean, the the most analogous question that I've come upon to how do you stop Bitcoin is how do you turn off the internet everywhere forever? Like that would pretty much be what you would need to do to really inhibit Bitcoin permanently, I think. That's very impressive. I didn't know that 20% of the hash rates are from China. It's a big number. It used to be much higher. I mean, admittedly, China's enforcement ban or enforcement effort had some impact, but it's still there. So... Hmm. I want to read you this. I want to keep. I have feel very strongly that inflation is theft. So I have to ask you another way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I tweeted this. Cutting a pizza into smaller slices does not mean there's more pizza to eat. The same is true of printing money since each unit of money represents a slice of the global capital stock. Printing money leads to existing holders of money having a smaller slice of capital yes that's that means the purchasing power of money goes down so how is that not theft Mm -hmm. who's stealing from who the earliest recipients of the newly printed money steal from the later recipients this is the cantillon effect i don't know if you've ever heard of that Mm -hmm. Um, well, I, I think, so how about, how about inflation more as a redistribution? For example, let's yeah. say you owe money. Let's say you owe money. Um, I have a mortgage. My money now is 
my mortgage is worth less. So I'm actually wealthier because of inflation. My debt is being disappearing. But let's say I'm a lender. Well, I was lending money to someone, but now my asset is worth less because uh, I'm going to be paid back in, in cheaper dollars. So, mm -hmm. so to say that it's theft, I, I would rather say that it's a redistribution from people who have money to people who don't have money. So in a sense, it's... Uh, uh, it's it's uh it's, it takes away money from people who are rich and gives it to people who are poor because of course people who are poor tend to be the people who are borrowing or are, are net indebted so to speak so uh yeah i i think of it as more of a redistribution you can say that maybe the poor people are stealing from the rich people or the borrowers are stealing from the lenders so that i think that's fair i okay <sighs> man sorry to keep be fighting on this point but um, that sounds good, like stealing from the rich to give to the poor, right? It's kind of Robin Hood esque. Yeah. But the past 50 years tell the opposite story. Like, since going off the gold standard and the expansion of fiat currency supply has increased, yeah. we could just focus on the US dollar here, that the disparity between rich and poor has actually widened. Hmm. So yeah. that seems to be contrary to the perspective you just shared. Uh, I think, well, it's there's a lot of things that go into that. And I think a big part is uh, just, you know, I there's a lot of cross currents happening in the past 50 years that contribute to that. Uh, that has to do with more than inflation. Uh, for example, um, over the past 50 years, well, first of all, it's important to keep in mind that the disparity within this country has increased, but mm -hmm. the absolute levels are poor people today have nicer cars and uh, better computers than they did 50 years ago. And if you look across globally, you have hundreds of millions of people lifted out of poverty in developing countries like China or India. Yep. So, so you have to keep that in mind as well. Now, the disparity, I think, structurally, I think it has to do with um, a couple of things, and that is that we're transitioning into a world where technology is and intelligence are much more highly valued than they were a hundred years ago. Say a hundred or a thousand years ago, people were mostly working with their hands, mm -hmm. and so you know when it comes to working with their hands, labor, things like that, there's not that much of a difference in ability between people. But if we move into a world where um, not just that intelligence is highly valued, but also it tends to be winner take all. For example, there's just one Amazon, and all the other small shops collapse, and there's only one Google, and all the other search engines disappear. You, you create a kind of a winner take all effect, and in just across industries and globally as well. So you have fewer and fewer people able to benefit from it, even though everyone is rising together some people are raising a lot more so i think it has to do with just the structure both of the economy and, and also of the competition landscape and uh, to the extent that the money plays a role well i don't know i i mean it's hard for me to imagine that inflation wouldn't actually be something that hurts people who have assets more than people who don't have assets because again people who are uh, if you have a lot of money and there's inflation, your 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 wealth is kind of disappearing over time. So it's hard for me. And whereas if you have a lot of debt, it's becoming smaller over time. So well, it depends what the me. composition of your portfolio is, though, right? Like if you're holding 100% cash, your purchasing power is declining. But if you're holding 99% equities or real estate, something that's being bid up in the inflation, then you're not necessarily yeah. losing purchasing power. You could be gaining it, actually. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's definitely fair. So, um, yeah. So it does depend. You're right. Mm. Well, I appreciate you entertaining my uh, critiques of central banking here. Um, I'm very interested to try and like throw light on all of this. There's so much. It's so opaque to most people, right? You yeah, see I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. And you know what? Bitcoin is opaque to me. So I appreciate you <laughs> discussing some of the stuff like to me. <laughs> well, it is impossible to understand Bitcoin. That's for sure. But uh, 
it's nice that it, it's a system in which nothing can be hidden. Actually, you know, it's open source technology. It's just what you see is what you get. The code does what it says it will do and it does nothing else. There's no lines to read between as unlike the central bank system, right? Where what did Jerome Powell say? How did he say it? What was he wearing? What was the weather? What was his mood? How did they react? Like trying to read the tea leaves about what monetary policy is going to do next. Um, Bitcoin's kind of the complete antithesis to that, right? It's just, it is what it is. Nothing changes. Yes. Uh, nothing nothing giant, is hidden. Giant public ledger. Very transparent. Yes. So let me pivot here. I want to ask you a question about a tweet you put out. You said, I'll just read the tweet. There's a central bank put on bond prices as yep. declines in the price of these perceived safe assets will lead to the insolvency of the financial system. This post describes the problem and suggests a pause in the relentless bond sell-off is close. That's your penned tweet on your profile. Can you similarly unpack that? And we have to be, again, with the jargon, most people probably don't know what a put is. So what, what do you Absolutely. mean when you say central bank is a put on bond prices? You know, so in the financial system, a lot of people hold government bonds as safe assets. And part of it is because the government tells you that my bonds are safe <laughs> assets, so you must hold them. So, for example, if you're a bank or a pension fund, you probably have to hold a lot of government bonds. Now, here's the problem. They tell you that the government bonds are safe assets, but they can also, but what they mean is that the government won't default on you. You'll get paid back. But in the meantime, you can have pretty big declines in the price of your bonds. And if you are an investor that has a little bit of leverage in, maybe those price declines make it so that you get a margin call and you have to be forced to sell those assets. For example, most recently in the UK, a lot of pension funds were owning uh, UK government bonds, but the price of those bonds kept dropping that they got margin calls and they were forced to sell out of their positions. Now, when they sell, the price of the UK bonds declines further and maybe other people have to sell as well. So you get into a fire sell condition mm. where everything just kind of blows up. At the end of the day, in order to stop the um, fire sale, the Bank of England had to come in and basically act as dealer of last resort, or basically they, they came in and they put a floor on the price of those bonds. Mm. Now, when I say put, what that mean what what that means is what I'm trying to convey is that there's going to put a floor on the price of those government bonds. The reason is so many people hold these bonds as safe assets that if there was a big decline, you might have these huge margin calls forcing everyone to sell, pushing prices down further when someone somewhere might have to go bankrupt. So that's a huge mess. So the pension funds actually in the UK, some of them seem to have been on the brink of failure. That's not good to have a pension fund fail. Um, a lot of people depend upon that. So for the mm -hmm. sort of financial stability, uh, we just can't have the US treasury, uh, treasury yields go up every day. Another way of saying that is we can't have the price of treasury bonds decline every day. It's a systemic mm -hmm. risk. And so they're going to try to do something to make it stop. We saw that happen in the UK. And if you look over at Japan, they've been doing that for quite some time by something called yield curve control. What mm -hmm. that means is that uh, the, the government is willing to buy infinite amounts of government bonds uh, to make sure that the yields never rise above 25 basis points, so 0.25%. So this kind of financial stability risk is something that I think will is concerning to the central banks, to the authorities. And that makes that makes me think that they won't let the uh, bond sell-off continue, which is what's been happening the past couple of months. And it's been a very, very chaotic time. Mm. So if I'm hearing you correctly, there is this element of price fixing or price manipulation that is necessary to keep the financial system solvent. Yeah, actually, I think that's another way to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that seems like it's going to have a really bad ending. Uh, so the the outcome of this is 
So the Bank of Japan has been doing this for some time. They're just kind of fixing the price of their 10-year bond. Uh, the outcome is a weaker currency because the market is not able to express itself in terms of higher interest rates. So the release valve becomes a currency. Um, mechanically, let's say you're an investor in Japan and you don't want to buy something that's yielding only 0.25%, then you take your money, you go and you buy something in the U.S., or the European Union or something like that. And in the process, you sell your yen and you buy a foreign currency. So that's usually the consequence of someone putting a binding cap on interest rates. Mm. Uh, the financial system is it's kind of like a balloon. You pinch one part and you know the other the air goes to another part. So it's a dynamic mm. system. Mm. It doesn't have you... to end badly, but there are distortions. Well, when you say that Okay, so declines in the price of these perceived safe assets will lead to the insolvency of the financial system. I guess you're not predicting then the insolvency of the financial system. You, you're you saying no, that no. the price fixing is the necessary door... to prevent the insolvency. Exactly. So what we've learned, so uh, for the past few decades, central banks were like, oh, you know what, market base, laissez-faire and so forth. And then they let Lehman fell and the whole world was on the brink of catastrophe. And they're like, mm -hmm. you know, that's not a good idea. We shouldn't do that anymore. <laughs> so mm -hmm. whenever something bad happens, they're going to jump in and make sure that the system stays together. Mm -hmm. We saw that during March 2020 as well. They went mm -hmm. all in, even so far as sending money to uh, to individuals, to STEMI checks to try to keep mm -hmm. the economy afloat. I think that's how the world works now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... When the market, I, I think this is what you said, so correct me where I'm wrong. When the market cannot express itself through interest rates, as we've seen in Japan, right? The the inevitable outcome is a weaker currency. Yes. It's really, that's really it, right? There's no, what else could it be? Uh, it could be inflation as well. Um, Which is a weaker but, currency. Uh, you're exactly right. Exactly. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Okay. So are we then in a position where we are expecting to see the weakening of currencies worldwide because every central bank is more or less in the same situation? That's my view for the coming years. And the reason is because we're just printing so many treasuries. Mm -hmm. I think of treasuries, so like I discussed earlier, just the money that pays interest. And the trajectory of the deficit, which is you know, deficits are made up by printing treasuries. It's just enormous. Um, if you think back uh, 10 or 20 years ago, we had deficit hawks in Congress and they would sometimes have balanced budgets. Pre-COVID, we were issuing about $500 billion a year in treasuries. From now on, the projection is at least a trillion dollars a year, basically forever. And if we have more spending, that will go higher. So the amount of uh, printing that we're doing is just insane. I think that higher inflation is basically guaranteed for the coming years. Mm. Where, what are your views on Bitcoin, both overall and in this specific macro environment that you're that you see in the years ahead? Well, you know, I'm an evidence-based person, and the evidence seems that. Over the past couple of years, we've had significant inflation, but you know the, the performance of these hard assets has been very mixed for gold and for Bitcoin. So I think it's really hard for me to say that. Uh, you know, I, 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 my best guess is they would trend higher because when you have an inflationary world, assets prices all trend higher. Um, but beyond that, I, I don't really know. It mm. seems Bitcoin seems a bit mysterious to me. I'm not exactly sure what drives it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, your world seems extremely mysterious to me. Um, how So how long were you with, uh, I guess you were with the Fed, actually, or with a, a separate bank? Yeah. With I was the... with, uh, so the Fed only has one trading desk, and that's in New York, and that's uh, that's where I was. Okay, and how many years were you there? Five years. Five years, and you've now been doing the Fed Guy blog for how many years? Yeah. Uh, one, I guess. I I teach people about uh, monetary, economics, Fed, things like that. Mm. So I have a blog. I also have a book and I have some online courses for anyone who's interested. Very interesting. Okay. Um, one last question that I, I wanted to, well, a couple of but, 
for those interested, if you're interested in the financial system, it's on um, Amazon. Central Banking 101 is the book he just showed for the audio listeners. Yep. Um, okay. Do you have a few more minutes? Because I do have a couple of more questions. Yeah. Okay. Please. So sorry to bombard you with so many things here, but you're just such a good guy to talk to about these things. Okay. Central banks worldwide, are they more coordinated or are they more antagonistic toward one another? And has that changed uh, over time? So both. Um, so I think historically, if, if you recall, I mean, we've had something like the Plaza Accord before where everyone gets together and, and tries to manage the system. Uh, if you recall in 20, 2008 and 2020, when the world was falling apart, we had all central bankers all come together to collectively act as lender of last resort. You have the Fed doing the swap lines and so forth. So there's a lot of coordination uh, between central banks to try to keep the system together. Um, when I was at the Fed, I would tell you, I can tell you that we actually had uh, frequent calls with other central banks to tell, let each other know what we're seeing and what we're thinking. Um, these happen at the staff level and, and also at very high levels as well. So there's a lot of coordination. Uh, the central banking community, at least among the Western world, is it, all people share the same views of the world. You know, they study in the same schools. They all went to uh, do their PhD at MIT or something. And they also have very similar problems, um, similar economic systems. So a lot of them are kind of already on the same page. Now, they can also work in antagon uh, work in opposite directions as well. Mm. Um, an easy way to see this is what's happening with the dollar right now. So the Federal Reserve is trying to tame inflation in the U.S. by raising interest rates and strengthening the dollar. That lowers inflation in the United States. However, it raises inflation for everyone else. The reason it raises inflation is because many commodities are priced in dollars. So let's say Japan, for example. Um, Japan uh, because of the stronger dollar, the yen was 100 yen per dollar. Now it's about 140 yen per dollar. That means a barrel of oil is, is going to be 40% more expensive today than it was before. So that raises inflation in Japan as it would raise inflation in, in any other country. So they're kind of working in opposite directions now if uh, everyone is trying to, okay, well, maybe not Japan. Japan is not too worried about inflation. But if you were looking at the Eurozone, they are worried about inflation and a stronger dollar is making it more difficult for them to do their mandate. Mm. So so they so they play two roles. I mean, sometimes they work together to prevent a disaster, and I'm mm. sure they still would, but they also have objectives that run um, that are antagonistic to each other, as you mm. suggested. Mm. Who are the shareholders of central banks? Uh, maybe just the Fed specifically. Uh, well, technically... Okay, this is how the Fed is organized. You have Federal Reserve Banks, which are actually private corporations, private nonprofits. The shareholders of those are actually um, uh, private banks, private commercial banks. Um, they usually have directors that are also part of the community. Let's say you, they would have some random nonprofit to also sit on the board of directors as well as to represent their community. Uh, the Federal Reserve Board, that was part of the government. And so they answer in theory, to the, uh, to the, I guess, to the executive and, of course, the broader American public. Um, I think in practice, though, that the Fed is, is actually very sensitive to politics. Um, there's a lot of political influence between mm -hmm. the White House and the Fed, and I think we've seen that in the past couple of years. Uh, for example, in 2020, 2021, when the White House wanted to pass big spending, you had the Fed basically on board and encouraging it. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't see how it could not be politically sensitive, right? It's a it's an organization of human beings. The the whole notion of central bank independence has always struck me as something quite asinine. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think there's a good saying by one of the former Fed chairs, Fed chair Martin, I think, in the nineteen. I think it's nineteen seventies. His comment was that the central bank was independent within the government but not independent of the government so that's trying to trying to walk that fine line between independence and trying to also uh be accountable and acknowledge the political realities so mm. they're trying to uh, uh, yeah so 
the reason we want to have an independent central bank is that we don't want, let's say, a government coming into power and then doing a whole bunch of inflationary inflationary policies. Right? That's the whole point of having an independent mm -hmm. central bank. That's a good one. Uh, I might repurpose that quote to say that Bitcoin is independent within the government and independent of the government. <laughs> <laughs> um okay one last question and i'll let you go here what is the end game of this what is the end game of the monetary system with all of all things considered all the cross currents the cooperation the antagonism the conflict in ukraine the digital age like the shifting media landscape where are we headed like everyone seems thoroughly confused where do you think we are going like that's a really good question, and what, from what I see, what we're doing right now is clearly unsustainable. Uh, the federal government is basically thinking that it can print and spend forever trillions of dollars. That's just not realistic, and not just them, but governments in other countries as well. They've been used to a world where they were able to do this and nothing bad happened. Now they're just turning it up a notch or turning it up 10 notches. So eventually, we're going to come to a point where... Um, where where that won't be sustainable anymore. And I think that will manifest itself in high and sustained inflation. Um, there are two ways that this can happen. Uh, so when that happens, there are two solutions to that. We can have a moment like we did in the 1980s where we actually raise taxes significantly. We actually raise interest rates significantly. We go through a time, very a very deep recession, a very troubling economic time. And we come out and then we can kind of continue on like we were before in a much restrained way. Um, no more massive deficits. And the, the risk, in my view, is that as a as a country, I don't think that people can accept pain the way that maybe our forefathers could. We seem to be, um, you know, maybe a little bit spoiled as, as a country. We've got accustomed to living a very comfortable life. And if we're not willing to accept pain, then inflation is going to continue to get out of hand and we might need to have maybe some very fundamental changes uh, maybe just the new government completely you know that sounds crazy that maybe we'd have a new government with a new currency but throughout history it's actually really common especially mm -hmm. when you have a government that completely abuses its power and conducts tremendously inflationary policies by printing and spending so i know that sounds insane but uh that seems to be a non-trivial possibility, not immediately, but uh, say a decade or so. Wow. Well, it uh, you certainly... know what? When that happens, the number of Bitcoin will still stay the same. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Independent within and of government. Um, that view you have on the future does not sound insane at all to me. It's actually what we talk about a lot that... Um, there's a great book called The Sovereign Individual, and it predicted a lot of this. I don't know if you've ever read it, but it, it oh, written in 1997. I won't ruin it for you, but it predicted things like social media. It predicted the use of a pandemic by governments to reassert the validity of their borders. Okay, now I got to read that. <laughs> yeah, it also predicted the rise of anonymous digital cyber cash, something like Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. whatever. And... um yeah, the the implications of that invention of that that transition into the information age, as they call it, is the yeah. fragmentation of governments. They think we move from a world of two hundred nation states to one of twenty thousand. So that has been a very impactful book on my thinking, and it does seem like the day of reckoning draws ever closer. Because, as you said, we can't keep printing and spending trillions of dollars. It doesn't. Something has to give. Money yes. does not grow on the proverbial trees. It actually uh, must come into existence through work. You can't just redistribute it into existence. So. Exactly, exactly. Okay, I definitely ordering this and reading it sounds fascinating. <laughs> it's a little bit of a, a slog to get through, but I think everyone that's read it has very much appreciated it. So Yeah, I used to be a lawyer. I'm very good at reading very boring things. I used to do it for a living. There you go. All right. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. Um, Joseph, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, would you 
please let my audience know where they could find out more about you or your work. Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm on Twitter at FedGuy12. And you, if you're interested in the markets, you can check out my blog, blog at FedGuy.com. Awesome. Joseph, thank you so much. Pleasure.